This burger recipe is sponsored by Squarespace. Your basic, big, thick, juicy burger. Nice and flat, not all bunched up in the middle. I've been boning up on burgers lately, and I'm going to show you what I've learned. We'll do some outside on the grill, and some others inside in a pan. I think thick burgers require totally different technique from thin burgers and different ingredients. For a thick boy, I want freshly ground, loosely packed beef. The stuff butchers generally grind in-house and comes out looking like worms. This stuff works far better for a thick burger than ground beef that has been vacuum packed in a tight little brick. This is Chuck, the classic burger cut. You can get way more creative with your cuts, but make sure whatever you're using is at least 20% fat. A thick burger is going to be anywhere between 5 and 8 ounces, 140 to 230 grams raw weight. I'm at the top end of that spectrum here. And the key is don't try to mix seasoning into the interior of the meat. Do not knead the meat. Don't squish it really hard. Just gently pat it into a patty that's a little wider than how you want it in the end because it's going to shrink as it cooks. I like to rotate it around and use my thumb to form a nice clean edge. When you pack ground beef really tightly or knead it really aggressively, you make the cooked texture really dense and rubbery. And that effect is exacerbated if you work salt into the meat. There's chemical things that happen, protein bonds formed in response to the salt, and also just the kneading and the smushing keep the internal texture as loose as possible for a thick burger. The only reason you can get away with kneading and salting meatballs and meatloaf is because there you're working in breadcrumbs and vegetables and other things that disrupt the protein matrix. That's great, but it's not a burger. That's a burger. And it'll cook even better if I depress the middle, try to work the patty into like a lens shape, or I guess it's an inverted lens. I want the outer ring of meat to be thicker to slow its cooking. The rim has more surface area, so it gets more heat and is therefore liable to cook faster than the rest of the burger. When that happens, the rim of meat constricts and smushes the center of the burger, causing the center to bunch up in the middle. Then you have an elliptical burger that does not lie flat on the bun. Make that outer lip thick and you slow its cooking. Since we can't season the interior, we have to season the exterior really aggressively, especially for thick boys like these. You might not want that much salt, but I do. And I want lots of pepper. Remember, there's a lot of meat here. And then the burger seasoning that I swear by is garlic powder. I'm a fan of this stuff generally, but particularly on burgers. The meat will keep the granules kind of wet enough that most of them shouldn't burn. I've had my grill preheating and burning off the sludge from my last grilling. For a thick burger, I want moderate heat. On my gas grill, that means maximum heat. Gas grills are generally pretty weak compared to a charcoal grill. For charcoal, build a moderately hot fire. If you don't know how to do that, you just need to practice. Every grill is different. For the grill, I don't like to use any oil on the meat or on the grill grates. It just drips down and causes flare-ups. And on a thick burger, I think oil can make the exterior go too dark brown before the inside is cooked. Don't push the patty into the grill grates at all. That'll make it far more likely to stick when it's time to flip. Just gently plop it on and don't touch it. I'll season the other side now. I'm a fan of constant flipping when it comes to steak, but with burgers, you just can't. You have to let the first side totally solidify as hard as possible before you flip. If you don't, the burger could fall apart. All the good crust could stick to the bars. No good. And I like to leave the lid open while the first side cooks. That lets me cook the bottoms as firm as possible without overcooking the interior. When you close the lid, you trap ambient heat and turn the grill into an oven. It cooks from all directions. I just want to cook from the bottom at first. A nice spirited sizzle there, but nothing too crazy. If the grill was too hot, there'd be a bunch of smoke at this stage. You'd smell burning. If I was cooking this over charcoal, I'd pile my coals unevenly so I could move the burger from hot zone to cool zone if necessary or vice versa. I can feel that's not ready to flip yet. It's going to stick. I got some time to go inside and think about toppings. It's Vidalia onion season and my old friends at A&M Farms in Georgia sent me a box. Hashtag not an ad, just a fan. Vidalias are extremely low in pungent sulfur compounds, so they're great to eat raw on things like burgers. And I've got some lettuce and some pickles. That's enough. All right, these have been on the grill for seven minutes. And really, no matter what you do, you'll need to scrape the burger a little bit to get it off the bars. Get every surface released before you flip or it's going to break apart, especially because we didn't overpack the meat. That loose internal texture is going to make the burger much more delicious to eat, but right now it makes it more delicate to handle. Get every bit scraped clean off the bars before you flip. 
At this point, we're likely to have flare-ups because lots of fat is rendering out now and dripping down and catching fire. A little flame char on meat goes a very long way. I don't want this to taste burned, nor do I want cancer, which is a thing with burned meat. So I will close the lid, mostly to deprive those flames of some oxygen. They're still flaming in there, but probably not as bad. I like to cook burgers most of the way on side one to get them firm enough to flip safely. Side two needs half as much time. If you see a little juice pushing to the surface, that means the inside is going to be about medium. If you see a lot of juice flooding the surface like that, that means the burger is going to be cooked all the way through by the time it rests, which is how I want it. I am not a fan of pink burgers, and there's some health risk there too. Real quick, I gotta melt my cheese. Reconstituted American cheese really was made for burgers because it melts so easily, but I'm actually just using normal cheddar slices today. They're gonna melt just fine if I close the lid and turn the grill into an oven to trap the ambient heat. Give it a minute and then have a look. Eh, I like it a little meltier. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, ding! That was seven minutes on side A, four or five minutes on side B, including the cheese melting time. For a thick burger, that's cooked all the way through. And for a thick burger, I like to let it rest on a plate for a couple of minutes. It's gonna push out some juice at this stage, and I'd rather that juice go out onto the plate instead of into the bun. I hate soggy buns. Fancy burger joints these days often make their burgers too juicy for my taste. They're a mess to eat. Speaking of buns, I'll turn off my grill just to toast my buns a little in the residual heat. If you want, you can butter the cut sides and you'll get an even nicer effect than I do here. I'll close the lid and let the buns steam through and get hot. After a minute, that's enough for me. I don't want the bread to taste burned. I mostly just want it to dry out so it can absorb some moisture without getting soggy. People often like to put mayonnaise on the bottom bun to serve as a moisture barrier. Water doesn't mix with fat. But I don't especially like mayonnaise, so I prefer to use a single solid piece of lettuce as waterproofing for the bottom bun. Get my sweet Vidalias on there, straight from Lyons, Georgia. And a burger, to me, is mostly just a dill pickle delivery device. Mustard and ketchup. If you put your condiments under the meat, they actually hit your tongue before your tongue hits the meat, and it all comes together better in your mouth, I-M-H-O. And there we go, perfectly flat, a little wider than the bun, which is generally how I like it. I don't like bread-heavy bites. And even though it's cooked well done, that burger just crumbles in the mouth because we bought loose-packed beef and we didn't overwork it or season the interior. If you want a pink burger, pull it when you just start to see juice surfacing and put the cheese on like right after you flip. You won't have much time to melt it. All right, a good thing for doing burgers inside is a big cast iron pan, but you can do a thick burger in any pan. Thick burgers are just generally easier to do at home, in part because you don't have to crank the heat as high as you do for thin burgers. I think that's a little too hot, medium heat for thick boys. And these I will grease up. You don't have to worry about flame ups inside, and some oil will get you a nicer crust that'll compensate for the lack of smoky grill flavor, and it'll guard against sticking, which is a bigger hazard on a pan that makes full contact with the meat. Same seasonings as before, salt, pepper, and my beloved garlic powder. Slap it in there and we should hear a spirited sizzle, but nothing too crazy. Give the center a little push to make sure you don't have a steam balloon pushing the middle up and away from the pan. Plenty of fat is going to render out for cooking side B, so I have no idea why I put more oil on there. I just wasn't thinking. It's totally unnecessary, but more seasoning is definitely necessary. After five minutes, I can feel that A, this is not ready to be flipped, and B, that spatula is going to be too soft to scrape that off the surface. Honestly, I would do these in my nonstick if my nonstick was wide enough. Even in this huge cast iron, I can only do two patties at a time. Thank goodness they're each thick enough to feed one person each. There's a reason that thin patty burger joints especially favor a wide flat top grill. You just need more horizontal space. These look more than halfway cooked through. It's been seven minutes. It's now or never. A little scraping with something rigid and she's free, ready to be flipped. And look at all that gorgeous crusty browning. Boy, yeah, you can see I had plenty of fat in here to fry side B. No point in adding more. At this point, the flipping has introduced so much water into the pan that I can tell the temperature is dipping. I gotta boost my burner a little, and it takes a little longer to melt cheese in a pan, so I'm gonna put my cheese on right away. This is smoked Gouda from the deli counter. It really compensates for the lack of smoky grill flavor in the meat. It just doesn't melt as readily as you'll see. If you have a tight fitting lid, go for it, but I have to make do with a foil tent. Gotta trap some heat and some steam in there to melt the cheese as best as possible. 
All right, that's probably about as good as I can do without overcooking the burger. People use American cheese for a reason. It melts faster. I just like the taste of this. You can try to use a thermometer to gauge doneness, but burgers are really easy to eyeball once you've done it a few times and you know what your desired doneness just looks like on the outside. All right, all that rendered fat and olive oil in there is gonna make the cut sides of these buns fry up really beautifully golden brown. This part works way better in a pan, but honestly, toasting the bun by any means available to you really improves any burger. Oh yeah, that's gonna be good. Fried bread down, lettuce, onions. I always try to make sure to push the toppings out to the edge. It sucks when everything is bunched up in the middle, the middle gets messy, and the outside is bland. I got my pickles, ketchup, and mustard, and I think the meat has rested just long enough when I can just pick it up with my fingers. It's just a minute or two of resting to purge the excess juice that would otherwise soggy my buns. Look at that nice crispy browning there. You don't get that on the grill. That's fried meat. Again, a nice yielding texture, even though we cooked this all the way through. Through. I'll try to tackle thin patties at some point, but for a home-cooked meal, I think a thick patty is almost as user-friendly as Squarespace. Everything you need to build and run a website nestled within a toasted sesame seed bun. The bun, in this case, signifies the affordable monthly subscription you pay that covers just about everything. It covers Squarespace hosting your site for you. It also gets you so many tools for building a website, even if you have next to no technical ability. You just pick a template and start tweaking it. You can do this part for free. Throw together a simple personal portfolio site or an event site or even a store. I used Squarespace to sell my custom chef knife recently, and I will again once we've made more of them. This page took about as much time to throw together as it takes to cook a burger, seriously. And if you're selling your time rather than a product, Squarespace has schedulers you can drop right into your site. You can paywall content on your site. And if there's ever something you can't figure out how to do, there's a million help documents to consult because a million people use Squarespace for doing whatever it is you're doing. You're not alone. Draft your site for free, but when you're ready to pay to publish or to register a custom domain, go to squarespace.com slash and save yourself 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you to everybody out there who nagged me for years now to make a burger video. I told you I'd get around to it.